It's all right, I'll use the podium. <laughs> uh, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as mentioned, my name is Erin O'Halloran, uh, and tonight it is my great privilege to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, Robert Bevan. Robert is an award-winning journalist, author, and heritage consultant with many decades of experience across historical preservation, urban design and policy, architectural critique, and journalism. Uh, he has long served as the architecture critic for the Evening Standard and is the former editor of Building Design, to name just two highlights from a hugely impressive list of bylines, including stints at two of my favorite magazines, uh, Vogue Living and Wallpaper. <laughs> All of this is in addition to his important contributions to the cutting edge of heritage research, for which he has been rightly celebrated as one of the most compelling voices in the heritage world. He is the author of the acclaimed book, The Destruction of Memory, Architecture at War, which was re-released in a revised edition in 2015 uh, and also served as the basis for a film of the same title. And most recently, Monumental Lies, Culture Wars, and The Truth About the Past, which featured on several lists of the best books of 2022 and which forms the basis of his talk this evening. Robert is also a member of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, which advises UNESCO, as well as the Blue Shield, which addresses heritage and crisis, notably during times of armed conflict. The role and significance of the built environment in the midst of war forms the subject of Robert's destruction of memory, which I decided I would just highlight briefly since we're going to be talking about his other book uh, in, his, in his lecture. Uh, in Destruction of Memory, he argues with great eloquence and force that architecture is not an accidental victim of modern warfare, but one of its key targets. In eradicating the physical reality of the built landscape of people and habits, perpetrators execute a program of what Robert has termed enforced forgetting for, and I quote, memories, history, and identity are attached to architecture and place. Thus, in armed conflict, buildings, as much as people, are the enemy, are the target. This, Robert reminds us, is not to equate the destruction of buildings with the destruction of human lives on a moral, on a moral plane, but rather to begin to, con to contend with the extent to which the fate of architecture, the fate of schools, hospitals, libraries, public works, places of worship and social gathering, bakeries and grocery stores, is inextricably bound up with the fate of human beings, their cultures, and societies. This leads Robert back to the clauses on cultural genocide, which were drafted by Raphael Lemkin and rejected by the great powers at the United Nations uh, when they were defining genocide following World War II. It is a testament to the power and incisive insight of Robert's work that these discussions, first published in 2006, feel as if not more relevant in 2024 than they did when they were initially written. With a corpus as rich and diverse as Robert's, it can be difficult to know how to summarize it or take stock of it all. And this in itself makes him a particularly apt keynote speaker for the CHRC annual lecture. For we are at every level, from our graduate members through our postdoctoral fellows, faculty and directors, a profoundly even constitutionally interdisciplinary center. We are home to archeologists and legal scholars, historians, ethicists, curators, and political scientists. We insist on the prismatic nature of heritage research and the possibility, in fact, the necessity of understanding our subject in its holistic complexity. This is the vision and the bold mandate set out by our founder, Professor Dacia Viejo-Rose. And in sharing this vision and embodying this kind of organic interdisciplinarity, Robert more than fits in. He is CHRC family. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for being here this evening. I'd ask you all to please join me in welcoming him to Cambridge. Thanks, Erin. That was really super kind. <laughs> More than a bit embarrassing. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm going to talk mostly about this. This well, it still feels new. It's not that new now, but it feels new to me. Uh, Monumental eyes. And what I contend in it is that if we read a city carefully enough, it will tell us about our past. 
and just like a book on a library shelf or a document in an archive box, monuments, architecture and cities are evidence of history. What's more, the city's constituent elements, from the palace to the slum, are material evidence. Actual physical traces of past events, as well as witnesses to, to previous ways of thinking. Can you hear me all right, by the way? Thank you. Um, embedded within them, these containers of our daily lives are politics, economics, and values that may be very different from ours, but which are still having their effect today. As Hannah Arendt observed, the reality and reliability of the human world rests primarily on the fact that we are surrounded by things more permanent than the activity by which they were produced. So when our cities are reshaped as fantasies about the past, when monuments and statues tell lies about who or what events deserve immortalization, the historical record is being manipulated. When we are told falsely that certain architectural styles are alien to our culture, or that people naturally prefer to live among their own kind, the, reali reali the, reali blah, the reliability of the world is called into question. Our streets and squares are not the morally neutral, inert assemblages of brick and stone that they pretend to be. Even absences can be telling. We need only look around us and see, or rather not see, the memorials to female achievement, the black experience, or queer lives. For those with money and power to, to place a likeness on a pedestal, monuments are more often a tool to obscure the real facts of history, to shape a chosen narrative, to invent nationalist and civic traditions, and to enforce imagined communities that extend only to those deemed to belong. Statues of genocide heirs and colonial mass murders, murderers are put up in squares and on street corners for our edification. Monuments tell deliberate, calculated lies. And they are lies that are being mar marshaled in the culture wars. And the term culture war has often been ascribed to Pat Buchanan speaking at the 1992 Republican Convention in the aftermath of the LA uprising that followed the acquittal of LAPD officers for the brutal beating of Rodney King. Buchanan called for a war for the soul of America. He said, it's a cultural war, as critical to the kind of nation we will one day be as was the Cold War itself. He called for US cities to be taken back street by street, presumably taken from people of color. The 80s and 90s version of the culture wars was often, take, often took the form of accusations of political correctness. These aimed, as the anti-woke campaign does today, to stymie progress on social justice and reverse its gains. So we're not so much in the middle of a brand new culture war as deep amidst the latest campaign. With capitalism and the planet in crisis, and neither the parliamentary right or left able to effectively solve this permanent crisis, culture wars are also a useful distraction from demands for economic change and material gains. On the one hand, there's a post 9-11 fearfulness of the other, a neoliberal land grab of the public realm, and the rise in nationalism and nativism. And on the other, the black feminist, decolonial and queer critiques of the monumental canon that are um, having some success in changing the conversation. Activists are demanding not just more and better statues, but the toppling of stone and bronze street corner killers that have been used to whitewash reputations and justify the stolen fortunes of entire continents. Historic places and commemorative landscapes have both, both been contested over and over again down the centuries. But this time around, architecture and heritage are on the culture wall's front line. And I think often a telltale sign that uh, a monument to an individual event isn't what it seems is that it, it was erected decades or even centuries um, after the fact. And if we take the um, Confederate monuments in the US, uh, that's certainly true there. It was only after the formerly enslaved began to assert their freedoms and make political gains in the Reconstruction era that followed the Civil War that white supremacists shifted the focus of their monument building from the graveside, from the cemetery, to the centers of towns and cities, often the courthouse square, by organizations such as the United Daughters of the Confederacy. 
And these obelisks and generals and metal foot soldiers were not acts of mourning in those town centres. Instead, they were aimed to assert control over Jim Crow era segregated public space. They were territorial markers. Many were erected in the 1920s, almost half a century after the Civil War, and during another period when the African Americans were asserting their rights following the First World War. Um, and if we look at this, this is this doesn't really give you the scale. This is Stone Mountain in Georgia, the largest burst of relief in the world, I think. Um, huge, absolutely huge. Um, it has strong Ku Klux Klan associations. Uh, one incarnation of the Klan was founded on top of Stone Mountain. And these are massive images of the three Confederate leaders, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. Um, and as an idea, this project began in 1914 and work started, but for various reasons stopped in 1928. And it was only following the uh, 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education decision, which was a big blow to segregation and, the birth of, and saw the birth of the civil rights movement, that the state of Georgia uh, actually bought Stone Mountain in 1958 under a segregationist governor and work recommenced on this sculpture in 1964, and it was only completed in 1972. That's astonishingly recently, within my life that time at least. And there was a plantation theme park at the foot of the mountain that opened in the 60s, where the enslaved were called hands or workers rather than slaves. So, not a great place. <laughs> and the, the, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2019 has accelerated a pre-existing revisionist trend that's seen the toppling of these statues and others across the world, especially those honoring figures associated with slavery or colonialism. Um, and viewed through the lens of social justice, this is a timely response to the partial and prejudicial history these commemorative monuments symbolize. From the perspective of the conservative right, however, removal can amount to a form of woke grievance archeology span or cancel culture. It's not. This is simply the consequence of lies about the past finally being called to account, and a demand for that the commemorative environments of the present reflect larger truths and a more accurate history. Um, is it a slightly different dynamic on this side of the pond? This is uh, the Colston statue in Bristol not long after it was erected um, in a park created at around the same time. Um, and Bristol, as you know, was Britain's chief slaving port in the middle of the 18th century. But the horrific realities of the triangular trade were offshored as much as possible. And here in Bristol, um, Edward Colston has, was the city's most honored son, at the center of Bristol's self-identity as a city made admirable by a legacy of charitable giving. Colston commemorations included not just the, this city center bronze, um, toppled by Black Lives Matters activists in the summer of 2020, or the name of nearby Colston Hall, or the stained glass windows in the cathedral, or streets, schools, hospitals, almshouses, all named in his honour. Yet when Colston died in 1721, it was after a lifetime leading the Atlantic slave trade, when he was complicit in the deaths of many tens of thousands of Africans, branded and shipped in the sickening conditions of the Middle Passage. Like with the Confederate statues, appearances are deceptive here too. The toppled Colston bronze was not put up by grieving citizenry immediately after his death in 1721. It was erected in 1895, more than 170 years later, and half a century after the slave trade ended in most of the British Empire. And this and other statues and monuments, stained glass windows in the cathedral around the same time, were raised as part of a conscious, consciously shaped cult of Colston, promoted by Bristol's merchant elite. So while defending the mercantile narrative of the city's imperial history, the cult at the time was not so much about enforcing racial oppression locally. There were not many black Bristolians in the 19th century. This wasn't Jim Crow segregation like as in um, US. It was more about patrolling class. Colston was a historical figurehead used in creating a paternalist and cross-class 
civic narrative in the face of rising industrial unrest and labour organisation. That merchant elite is still operating in Bristol. In recent years, it has lobbied against changes to the statue's plaque that would have told the truth about Colson's bloody history. And um, this is something local campaigners countering Colston were pushing for over decades. So when they, um, their efforts to get the truth told about Colston were blocked yet again by the foot dragging of the city council and by an elite gentleman's club, the Merchant Venturers, they took matters into their own hands and rolled Colston into the same harbour from which his slave ships departed. Uh, this is poetic justice, and we should support the protesters. But in my book, I argue for a different response, a layered interpretation at scale that does not allow these problem monuments to remain standing uncorrected, the honour the honor given left in place, but which also sees them as important for the historical record. First, though, if we accept that buildings and monuments can be artefacts that are evidence of history, problems then arise if that material is inauthentic. And this is Crematoria One at Auschwitz, which operated from August 1940 in a pre-war munitions bunker adapted for its new function. And when the four new gas chambers in Birkenau adjacent went into operation, the camp authorities transferred the mass killings there and gradually phased out the first, this first gas chamber at Crematorio 1. Its furnaces and chimney were later dismantled and the holes in the roof used for introducing Zyklon B pellets were closed. Those chambers at Birkenau were, broken, or were blown up towards the end of the war by the retreating Nazis as the Red Army approached. And Holocaust deniers have infamously, infamously taken a no holes, no Holocaust position, falsely arguing that there were no holes in the collapsed, collapsed concrete roof slabs of the Birkenau gas chambers to deliver the Zyklon B. Therefore, no holes, they argue, means no gas chambers, means no Holocaust. Um, and these are the, 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 the ruins, the genuine ruins uh, 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 of uh, a gas chamber uh, uh, crematoria two at Birkenau. But unfortunately, Holocaust deniers were given something of an un unwitting, some unwitting material to argue that Auschwitz was fake. This is because crematoria one was reconstructed after the war when Auschwitz became a memorial and museum. And this was partly because of political narratives in Stalinist uh, Poland at the time, and partly pragmatically because Birkenau was a long way from uh, away and tourists were too lazy to walk there to the genuine ruins. So they reconstructed the furnaces, the chimney and the roof with the holes. Um, and the official Auschwitz website still says this object is preserved in an original state to a large degree. But this is not true. And this gives conspiracy theorists, Holocaust deniers, an in, because the reconstructed architecture is telling lies. And no holes, no Holocaust was at the heart of the libel trial in which disgraced historian David Irving sued Deborah Lipstadt and Penguin Books. And it was a Dutch architectural historian, um, Robert Jan van Pelt, who testified at the trial, amassing hundreds of pages of evidence from the ruins themselves, construction drawings, invoices for building materials, and other documentation to prove the presence of the gas chambers. That he had to was a disgrace, but he did. Fortunately, Irving lost his case in the face of this overwhelming evidence. And since then, no Holes, No Holocaust has been comprehensively refuted. And finally, a couple of years later, um, the actual holes were found with the bent reinforcement, reinforcement bars. And organisations such as Forensic Architecture and my work uh, has been inspired by Van Pelt's work. And it, because it shows that the devil really can be in the detail and the details have to be authentic. If we look at this image of Dresden, everything you see there from the cupola at the top of the Frauenkirche to the cobbles 
is fake, apart from a few stones in that facade, the dark patches. It was all, um, it, it, it was all reconstructed in the past few decades. And many worry that we are in a post-truth age where emotion and belief have achieved primacy over reality. On the face of it, architecture should be immune from such post-truth forces because there will appear to be no more indisputable evidence of the form of the present and the shape of the past than a weighty and long-standing building. The very physicality of architecture, its relative longevity, gives the impression of certainty. And what you see is what you get, lack of complication. Reality, Philip K. Dick reminds us, is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. As we saw from Crematoria 1, we cannot always take buildings at face value. But nonetheless, the architectural is a useful dupe for those wishing to manipulate the present by misusing the past. Because the apparent outward impassivity of non-figurative non um, structures is particularly effective at disguising its ideological content. So in a context where, as the anti-cosmopolitans are on the offensive, the foolish belief that this townscape is disinterested makes its manipulation an effective weapon against the truth. The architectural and commemorative environment thus has a much underestimated role in fostering and cementing falsehoods about history. It's a tool that renders these falsehoods physical, making them harder to refute. So when buildings and monuments are inauthentic, Aaron's tests of reliability becomes undermined. And you'd think then that uh, demands for authenticity in the present day would be heightened, but instead we're moving away from the concept. Um, and as I said, everything you see in this slide it, it, it is, it, it is almost new. Uh, the Frauenkirche was completed in 2005 as the first step in rebuilding of the entire Neumarkt. And Florence on the Elbe has become Las Vegas on the Elbe. Um, and, but not, the Neumarkt is not just a focus of tourist visits. The anti-Islamic group Pegida and neo-Nazis marched to the Frauenkirche construction site year, uh, month after month. Um, it became the, the reconstruction of, of uh, 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 historic monuments in Germany has become tied to the far right. And it's, uh, and it's in Germany where the culture wars have taken on their most architectonic character. And here, as a part of a concerted attempt to rebuild Blitz city centres, as historicist pastiche, we are seeing not just the rehabilitation of classical architecture, for a while entirely tainted by the Third Reich Associations, but also the rebuilding of long-vanished palaces, churches, and whole city quarters, as if Hitler had never happened. Um, in 2009, uh, UNESCO struck off Dresden from the list of World Heritage Sites, not for all this fakery, but because of a bridge being across the Elbe, built across the Elbe further outside the city. And there were other similar projects, uh, like Frankfurt Old Town. This is the old technical town hall built after, the, after it was bombed. Um, and this is the, the same area now. Or there are a few fragments of genuine historic architecture there, but m mostly it's faked. And if you get up close, you can see bits of modern insulation and things like that. Um, so and these, these are purposely forgetful efforts, and they're often linked to the alternative for Deutschland and various other far-right groups. So there's an ideological war underway, masquerading as a style war, Modernism, whose record at its utopian best was about building for a more egalitarian post-war world, is today under attack by resurgent and reactionary architectural traditionalism. Arguments about beauty that we hear from people like Michael Gove are a Trojan horse concealing a desire to reimpose conservative historicism. Of course, no particular architectural style has an intrinsic political value. Instead, architecture and style are put to political uses. It is useful, for example, for the right to demonize modernism as a style promoted by cosmopolitan elites, 
when they don't want to fund the architectural infrastructure of a welfare state or build social housing. Horizontally proportioned windows rather than austerity are then the problem. Unfortunately, under the influence of political expediency and in the wake of a postmodern theory hostile to historical materialism and what it sees as totalizing theories, essential concepts that have been valued for more than a century and promoted by the likes of socialist William Morris are being abandoned. And Morris's ideas, as I'm sure you know, were set out in the 1877 uh, Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings Manifesto. And these later found their way into key international conservation documents, such as the 1931 Charter of Athens and the 1964 Charter of Venice, and demanding authenticity in preservation and reconstruction. For example, intellectual honesty in being able to visibly separate new work from old. However, previously precise terms such as um, reconstruction or restoration are being used without their old position and are being undermined by potentially useful but ethically fraught and unregulated technologies such as digital copies that offer a superficial faux authenticity. Um, and the rot starts at the top, um, in UNESCO's case. Uh, and uh, UNESCO, for UNESCO, it's about political convenience and misjudged attempts at post-conflict reconciliation, as well as a desire to resist iconoclasts. In 2001, the notion of rebuilding the Bamiyan Buddhas was deemed unacceptable fakery by UNESCO. But only a few years later, the organization embraced rebuilding copies in the name of this, their reconciliatory role. Mostar, Mostar Bridge, for example, um, its 16th century Ottoman bridge in the city of Mostar, um, destroyed 30 years ago, 1993, November 1993, under shelling, it was deliberately targeted. Um, and in an attempt to unite the divided city of Mostar, UNESCO backed a World Bank project to rebuild it. And it opened in July 2004 and was constructed of largely new material assembled in traditional ways. But despite appearances and the symbolism of bridging communities either side of the river, the city remains as divided as ever uh, and getting more divided at present. Um, so the idea of reconstruction as reconciliation is an illusion. We don't have any evidence that this is true. Um, I, I think the bridge should have been uh, 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 reconstructed to, to resist uh, uh, those who would uh, use cultural genocide as a weapon. What I can't get my head around is that in 2005, the rebuilt span and the reconstructed area around it was declared a World Heritage Site. It was barely a year old. It's de a designation that was only possible by jumping through linguistic and conceptual hoops to ensure that the facsimile bridge made it past UNESCO's own strict authenticity criterion for World Heritage Site designations, a criterion that requires historic fabric to be actually historic. And as I say, there's good reasons to resist cultural genocide heirs even if this doesn't bring reconcilia reconciliation. But declaring a 21st century structure a World Heritage Site is making a nonsense of heritage and the authentic and of evidence. Similarly, in 2015, UNESCO declared that war-ravaged Palmyra in Syria would be rebuilt without even having inspected the damage. At the same time, the emphasis was put on the damage to Palmyra caused by ISIS and not that caused by Assad's forces and the Russians. Indeed, Putin's army was praised by UNESCO for recapturing Palmyra, ignoring his bombing of hospitals and civilian centres nearby. This kind of only encouraged Putin, emboldened him. In it, so in its eagerness to frustrate iconoclasts such as ISIS, UNESCO has set aside fundamental principles, and this is having consequences today in the Ukraine. So we have more data about the world, more measurements, more images of it than ever before in history. But we live in a time when verifiable facts are trashed as fake and unreliable alongside the expertise that identifies them. 
and where even the heritage organisations themselves are facilitating the confusion. Authenticity is a word in danger of being rendered meaningless by brand marketeers and pop psychologists, but which is too important to lose to such slipperiness. All manner of evidence is required if we are to successfully, successfully smash the mythology of colonialism and empire and have an honest reckoning with the past. And we need to place historical materialism and material evidence alongside witness testimony at the core of this process rather than the more unreliable and, and problematic idea of memory. And in this, I'm kind of revising some things I wrote in the destruction of memory. Um, um, so, um, but in this context, in the UK at the moment, in this post-George Floyd's phase of statue toppling, um, various commentators have claimed that statues and monuments aren't even history. And this simply won't do. Yes, they can be bad history, but their very evasions can reveal deeper historical truths. The evidence supporting, so because the evidence supporting the historical record is not only words on a page, but also material artifacts. Leon Trotsky might seem an unlikely source of design wisdom, but he was an astute cultural observer and understood the role of architecture as a record of history. He wrote of the Renaissance that it only begins when the new social class, already culturally satiated, feels itself strong enough to come out from under the yoke of the Gothic arch and to look, to look at Gothic art and all that preceded it as material for its own disposal. And this is more than an elegant metaphor. Uh, he believed that architecture, above all the arts, revealed the dialectical processes of the arc of history. So if we accept that there are evidence, what should we do about them? Because despite all the lies and distortions, monuments can have a good faith purpose. If suitably transformed from sites of honour into sites of shame or conscience or reactivated as thinking sites, Architecture more generally can help prove criminal responsibility for misdeeds such as ethnic cleansing and genocide. Who dropped the barrel bomb? Who shelled the bridge? Who looted the museum? Who, at Grenfell Tower, allowed the wrapping of high-rise public housing with deadly inflammable cladding? When mon where monuments were erected to the perpetrators of terrible deeds, they can tell us about the cynicism of the monument's backers. When erected to foster lies, they tell us that those lies were thought necessary. Certainly, this objectionable landscape can't be left untouched. However, at the same time as needing to create a more equitable physical environment, we have a duty to ensure that we don't forget that the ruling class has been perfectly willing to honour such genocide airs, such as Cecil Rhodes or Christopher Columbus in our public spaces. But the answers aren't as simple as they might first seem. So before we embark on a new iconoclastic wave, we need to acknowledge the many myths and understanding about why our commemorative landscape is the way it is and about great iconoclastic episodes of the past, especially those that came at the end of totalitarian regimes. And we need to go about this carefully so that we can forge a clear understanding of the past while safeguarding the evidence, particularly where sites have become entangled in the culture wars. And there's these many complexities to iconoclasm, many grey areas, and people misused past iconoclastic waves in order to justify the new ones. And here's a, just one example of, of, of that complex legacy. It's the monument to the Soviet army in Sofia, built in 1954 on the 10th anniversary of the liberation of the, uh, 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 of the country by the Soviet army. But um, in 2011, the monument was painted overnight by a group of anonymous artists who called themselves Destructive Creation and who dressed the Soviet army soldiers as the American pop culture char characters like Superman and Captain America and there's Ronald McDonald and Santa Claus in his Pepsi outfit. Um, and the caption scroll below means roughly in keeping, um, in keeping with the times. And the intervention might be seen as a critique or a celebration of capitalist consumerism or a calculated insult to Soviet militarism and occupation, or both. And Putin was furious at the injury to the memorial, and the paint job was removed within days. 
and it's actually now talked to being, uh, I think it's about to probably be removed altogether. Um, and given his bloody military campaigns to impose authoritarian rule in places such as Chechnya, Syria, and now Ukraine, it might be a bit rich that Putin is demanding that a Soviet war memorial be respected. But can we just dismiss the historical losses? Millions of Russians did die in the fight against fascism. Bulgaria was liberated, but also then occupied. Both things are true. Uh, and there are other complexities like the way Columbus was used to, uh, in America, depending whether you're Spanish, indigenous, or Italian immigrants who used the Columbus legend to become racialized as white. Um, for Native Americans, it is part of a genocidal catastrophe. Um, so there's all, all these complexities that come into play. So how best then to use the German terminology do we turn an Erdenmal, a monument that honours, into a Mahnmal, one that symbolises shame or regret? And I'd say a policy of subversive transformation demands a comprehensive recontextualisation at a scale that changes meanings, ideally in an additive layered way. And these new layers should challenge but not entirely obliterate the monument so that its original meaning can be, still be understood, even where the honour is undercut. A small plaque may offer some explanation, but will not alone change the monument's public role or the context in which it operates. Um, Cecil Rhodes has a case in point. You're probably very familiar with the whole saga and the bad faith uh, decision of Oriel just to end up with this little plaque at the foot of the building. Um, I won't go into detail here, but uh, it, 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 the, you know the honour remains. The building is still named for him, the wing, and he's there looking down on the high street. Um, um, and uh, in fact, the last uh, 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 Nadine Doris, when she was still culture minister, actually gave statutory protection to another uh, road, second road memorial around the corner. Um, so what are the alternatives uh, to, to a plaque or doing nothing? Um, um, there are many guerrilla and temporary interventions, like we saw in Sophia, uh, that offer useful lessons. Um, and here is Gladstone, and this is um, in Bow in East London, uh, outside Bow Church. And for many decades, he has had his red right hand painted bloody red. Um, who does it and why is unclear. If the paint is removed, activists repaint the blood in secret overnight. And in recent BLM conscious years, the assumption has been made that the red paint is commentary on the Gladstone's family linked to plantation slavery. However, the longer standing tradition is that it's a reference to the match girl workers at the nearby Bryant and May match factory. And the statue was paid for by the factory's owner in gratitude for a U-turn on a proposed match tax and erected with great ceremony in 1882 in Gladstone's own lifetime. And we can see what happens with memorials erected in people's own lifetime when we look at this, what happened with Jimmy Savile. Um, it's an urban myth that the match girls had to pay for the, sta for the statue out of stoppages from their own wages, although indirectly their labour created the profits that funded the gift. But this myth may be the initial reason for the red right hand, along with a commemoration of the successful 1888 strike that had figures such as Annie Besant at its head. And the action was notable as a turning point for women in the British labour movement. Um, apparently a plaque is to be erected nearby, commenting on Gladstone's less savoury side. But as at Oriel, this doesn't ch won't challenge at scale the honour given to Gladstone. So how about a counter-memorial that provides another narrative? Something commemorating the strike directly, maybe, or Eleanor or, or, or Annie Besant? or the slavery connections, or in a truly intersectional approach, both. Uh, there are other examples. This is Banks's proposal for the Colston statue. He was suggested um, get building, bringing the battered statue out of the harbour, covered in graffiti, putting it, back up, putting it back up on its pedestal, but adding some bronze figures of protesters 
eternally pulling it down, commemorating the day when they pulled it down, changing its meaning. Um, I'll just race through this one because conscious of time. Um, um, so, but how there's often these are very often temporary solutions, um, uh, and they can uh, um, not challenge the permanency of an existing memorial. So, how do we then turn a, a, a site of honour into a site of shame permanently? And examples of permanent contextualization, relayering or reworking at scale are remarkably few. Um, this is a practice in its infancy. Um, and this is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a almost literal minded uh, response. Uh, Carlos Col Colombino's uh, reuse of the parts of a monumental figure of the deposed Paraguayan dictator Alfredo. Stosner, um, and he's configured the body parts between two concrete blocks in the square of the disappeared, crushed and reconfigured, but, but still recognizable. Uh, but the example which I think is most useful is in Balzano in northern Italy in the uh, Italian Tyrol. Um, here, there's this massive um, relief of uh, this is on the on the what was the fascist headquarters? It's the largest fascist art work surviving in Europe. Um, 198 square meters of stone. It was actually completed in 1957. Um, crazy after the war. Um, so um, and it, it's a multicultural town. Um, part Italian, part German, um, and they, um, there was a, a lot of debate about what to do with the fascist monuments in the town. Uh, and in uh, 2010, um, uh, there was a letter from various activists and historians, and a competition was held to uh, recontextualize the frieze. Um, and uh, this was the winning entry. It was very simple. It's Hannah Arendt again, um, and the LED letters say in three local languages, no one has the right to obey. And it's a commentary on the uh, uh, fascist slogan, uh, believe, obey, combat, which you can see under uh, Mussolini's horse. Um, and the wording is from a radio interview where Hannah Arendt was paraphrasing Kant while discussing her book about totalitarianism. And the choice of words is a clever, layered commentary on the fascist slogan. The monument is preserved, but its meaning has been changed by the addition of the condemnatory phrase. Arendt is reminding us that we have an eth ethical duty to resist, that there's always a choice, including whether we properly act to address contested heritage in ways that serve both justice and history. The minimal, minimalism of the intervention, the artist said, um, is a pointed contrast to the grandiloquence of fascist aesthetics. So we've got truths have been told, and an animal has become a manmal. And only a few years ago, Bolzano, the city of Bol uh, Bolzano, had some fascist city councillors from the Casa Pound party. But in the last national uh, uh, election in Italy, um, the, the far right did very badly here. And we, I don't think we could put this down to uh, 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 changes to the monument, not this, this but others, including a, a victory arch and, uh, and, and various other points. But maybe we can partly attribute that political change to having a serious conversation about the issues. Um, I, I, th I think to argue that the monument itself, or the changes to the monument uh, court had that impact, is giving objects too much power. Figurative statues are the, simply the most attention-seeking, most visible aspects of heritage manipulation and mostly visible only after their true meaning has been brought back to our attention by diligent activists. So there's a danger in a, a kind of culture war collusion in a focusing attention on symbols whose removal creates an illusion of change 
while systemic justice continues unaltered? Isn't it mass incarceration rather than a problematic commemorative landscape that's the chief motor of contemporary Jim Crow? And uh, an activist in Charlottesville uh, was uh, uh, questioned the removal of, of one Confederate statue outside the courthouse in Charlottesville as doing precisely that, sowing an illusion that society had changed by changing its symbols. So, because we needed to question the degree to which changing the built environment generally alters lives and values. There are many determinist delusions, cause and effect expectations about the impact of monuments and of iconoclasm, or indeed architecture and architectural styles more generally on us and on politics and on societies. Winston Churchill's often repeated remark that we, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us is in truth a problematic oversimplification. There is an underlying thread of determinism here that architecture and design have heavily invested in and promoted the belief that design may not simply build more equitable places that possibly shape lives, which it can, which actually cause social change rather than simply reflect it. And it's a view that not only marginalises the agency of people in driving societal change, but peddles myths about our behavioural response to the physical environment that persists to this day. And arguably these myths continue when we believe that a more progressive and more inclusive monumental landscape will itself produce a social change. Yes, we need to be able to separate out truths from lies, not just online or in news bulletins, but in the built environment. And yes, we need to look at ways we can layer our monuments on our cities and that turn sites of honour into sites of shame, that change the meaning of the past without losing altogether the vital evidence of that past from the public realm. But we must also distinguish between irrelevant symbolism and generally, genuinely damaging ideology, between positive real-world political and socio-economic changes and misguided architectural determinism. It's possible too that tolerating uncomfortable evidence might be easier within the context of real world gains. And real change, as I said, comes through the agency of people, not through changes to symbols or material objects. Without such an approach, there's a real concern that we, in the name of progress, pave the way to a kind of Humpty Dumpty populism where truth, including truth in architecture, is whatever you say it is. If we fake, or destroy the evidence, including that of the architectural record, how can we ever learn from it or guard it against those who would use an absence of facts against us? Fundamentally, if we can no longer trust the tangible world around us to tell the truth, then we're in real trouble. So we need to be able to trust the veracity of our built environment, and, and Hannah Arendt can guide us here too. She warned that the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or communist, but, quotes, people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between truth, true and false no longer exists. So evidence, including the material of evidence of architecture and monuments, matters. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Sit down and have a well-deserved de rest for a few minutes. Um, my name is Wendy Pullen, and I'm just going to say a few words in, in uh, response to this, this wonderful lecture that we've just had. Um, I th think that I probably want to begin um, by saying simply that um, it's a provocative lecture. And thank you very much for that, because we need to think about these things, and we need provocation. Um, and of course, what goes along with that is it's also a brave lecture. Um, and and uh, you know, it takes guts in the times that we live in today to get up and say some of these things. So again, thank you very much for both of those things that I think really 
go together. Um, now, I should probably say I'm, I'm an architect. I'm not an archaeologist. Um, but I've had many years of connections with this, this group here. And um, Aaron, I'm afraid in your list of all the people that you work with, you didn't have architecture in there. <laughs> but in any case, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, the question of, of, of heritage and, and the way it's dealt with in the archaeology department um, and the way I think we're learning to deal with it in, in architecture, I mean, they, they go together. They're really companion pieces. So I just want to speak for a few minutes as an architect uh, and to, uh, to bring that in a little bit more fully because, I mean, Robert puts huge emphasis um, on, on the, the built fabric, the physical fabric, and the, uh, you know, as, as, as a constant. And I couldn't agree with this more, but I think it's one of the areas that's terribly misunderstood. Um, I think for, well, I mean, in academia nearly all of the time, um, the verbal argument or the textual ar argument is what's privileged, always. And um, those of us who work in areas that have to do with material culture and the physical environment um, and, and visual imagery um, are always, I think, seen as a bit of, of a second-class um, uh, 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 member of the academic community. Um, in a lot of ways, the, the visual is seen as something that's an add-on. It's a luxury if you, you know, if you have the time and, and inclination to deal with it. So I think it's, it's extremely important to, to function, or, and, um, to the way we function, um, to actually focus almost entirely on that. And I'll say that, that you know, as an architect speaking here, I think it's important to realize that um, the, the physical fabric and, and visual imagery is not just another way of looking at the verbal or the textual. I mean, we're actually looking at ontological differences here. Um, that that uh, what is verbal and what is textual um, is, is essentially linear. I mean, that has to do with narratives. Whereas the sorts of things that Robert showed us tonight um, have a great deal of what I would call simultaneity, that we're looking at environments and even the, the statues, um, the relief sculptures, and so on, they're very much part of a total environment, and that's how they're experienced. I mean, there was that one picture um, that you showed in Georgia that made so much more sense, because there was a man there, I think, with a megaphone or something, and he pointing to it, and all of a sudden, there was scale, and it came alive, and we started to understand how it, was, it was part of a, of a much larger environment and therefore ultimately um, a larger conversation. Um, so I think it's really, really important um, for those of us, and I'm assuming it's most of the people in this room, that we, that, that, that we look at things from that perspective of, of the simultaneity. Now, um, we can, we can um, say, well, you know, what happens when, you know, when the bad guys come along and they decide they want to wipe the whole thing out. And one of the narratives that I think is part of this that perhaps didn't feature so much in, in the lecture tonight is this idea of the clean slate. Um, we're finding that a lot in, in, the, um, in the cities that are being targeted in wars today, that it's no longer a case, certainly not of collateral damage, it's no longer a case of, of selective destruction, that there's this, this idea that you level the whole city, that you end up with what is a clean slate, and then there's an economic, economic uh, argument that comes into this as well that has to do with the, um, the, the authoritarian power in a lot of cases, where they'll bring in a consortia of um, um, business people in order to rebuild. Now, unfortunately, what we're finding in the architectural world is um, support for that. The RIBA, a few years ago, had an exhibition on the clean slate. 
the idea that it gave tremendous creativity to architects to have nothing there and just be able to come in and design up a storm and design whatever they wanted and they could solve all of the previous problems of, of that city um, if they only had a clean slate. And it becomes equated with an idea that we talk about as, um, as freedom. You know, this is seen as the ultimate freedom in, the, in these areas to, to, um, uh, to have the clean slate in order to, that we can design it. That's really, really problematic. And I think it goes with so much of the, the, the sort of discussion that you're talking about here. Now, I think the, the last point that I'd like to make um, is coming back to this idea of simultaneity and, um, and, and what's, what space does for us, what, what it means to be part of an, a, whole, a whole environment. Um, and, and I think... Um, I think that there's, you know, the question of truth and lies, I mean, which do we go with? That, that, um, that Robert's book, the title, um, is Monumental Lies, Culture Wars and the Truth About the Past. So you have both lies and truth in your title there, which I assume was very intentional. Um, you may want to come back on this one, <laughs> just when I finish, but in any case, it's very polemical. And I guess what I, I would question is, um, as we're using spaces in cities, in real life, going about our ev everyday activities, um, is it really most of the time as polemical as that? As I would say that the sort of spaces that we use um, really in our everyday lives. So when we work, you know, when uh, we socialize, when we shop, all those different, very, very ordinary sorts of things um, are steeped with experience. Most of the experience is not going to be that important. They're not like the life-shaking moments that we've seen such good examples here today. Uh, most of life that goes on is, you know, is what we can talk about is something very, very ordinary and very, very everyday. But somehow they, they do get steeped in these spaces. And it means that people who completely disagree with, with each other can come and try to experience these spaces just because it's part of what their lives are. So you know, they may have to go and buy their cucumbers in the market or, or you know, re I mean, really, really simple things like that. They may even hate each other, but the fact that they, that you know, if they're lucky enough to see, you know, the so-called other, that they have a sense of what the other looks like, they might even hear another language, um, that there's actually a certain common ground that comes from that space. So that what we're looking at is actually not a question of either truth or lies. It's very, very much a dynamic of different possibilities playing one off against the other. And of course that gets multiplied many, many, many times because there's many people going through many different activities. So we're talking about a real complexity, I mean a, a field of many, many different dimensions there. But what I would argue is that it's the place that offers the possibility of enough common ground so that even when people have great disagreements, they may have great hatreds and animosities towards each other, but there is that kind of primary experience in the place that for most people happens day after day after day, because this is their ordinary lives, and that somehow gets built in to, uh, you know, to, to what life in that particular place is about. And it's... Um, and, and so that, that it, it becomes actually a very, very rich dynamic, um, a very, very little events, but still a rich dynamic that goes on um, over, over very long periods of time. And of course it builds and it changes, um, and sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's weaker and so on, but that it is, that it is very much there. And that's, for me, one of the great um, values really of, of architecture and urban space 
and all of the things inside of it. And, and so, you know, I would say that along with that, it's, you know, it's all, it's the, all of the images and the monuments and the slogans and the graffiti and, and all those different sorts of things. So, Robert, thank you. If you, I, I don't know if you want to come back and talk about lies and, and truth or whatever. I mean, I think also we, yeah, we have a little bit of time for questions. If you'd be willing to to answer the questions, um, so come back. You've had your rest. 